Let's talk about some of the chemical engineering terms that'll be helpful to know as we talk about moving from the kitchen scale to the actual production scale for some products. So first up is scale up. Scale up is what you do as you are moving from a very small amount of potential product up to a larger amount of potential product. And in fact, uh, the different scales you might work at have some commonly understood names. There's bench scale, where you're usually thinking in terms of chemistry, so they do chemistry on a bench. For us, that's like kitchen scale or even restaurant kitchen scale. And then there is pilot scale, which is in the middle. It's not big enough to be a factory that produces enough product for millions of people, but it is certainly enough product to uh, uh, do wide scale testing on. And then you have industrial scale, which is the full-on scale where you're making as much stuff as you need to make. A couple of other terms that are going to be helpful here are a continuous process and batch process. And what these mean is they de describe the way in which our industrial scale process operates. Does it operate continuously? And uh, a nice model of a thing that you've seen that operates continuously is if I say, imagine a factory in your head. Um, a lot of what we've seen uh, when I've shown how it's made videos um, on our YouTube collection, those are showing continuous processes. The popsicles just keep popping out of the machine and into the wrapping machine. They just keep going. And uh, over time, there's no variation at any particular point in the process. The same exact thing is happening all the time. So uh, the contrast to this is what's called batch scale. And batch is what you are used to when you take an action in the kitchen. So if you think back to the chocolate covered strawberries uh, project, at any given moment, you were doing something different. Okay, so over time, it varied. That's a batch process. It has a beginning, it has a middle, it has an end. Okay, then let's uh, look at a closer example of a continuous process. This here that I have drawn is uh, a little bit of the chemical engineering uh, symbols for a distillation column. And uh, what's a distillation column? It's something that separates a mixture into component parts based on their boiling point. And I'm about to give you star of simplification because uh, I'm gonna leave some bits of this process out. But I want you to imagine for a minute that you are looking at this thing uh, in a chemical plant that is a petroleum refinery. This is a key operation in a petroleum refinery. And uh, in a petroleum refinery, you would have crude oil coming into your distillation column. It probably wouldn't be fed in the middle. Remember, I have the star of, this, uh, of simplification. And then down here at the bottom, you've got a heater so that this liquid goes down to the bottom and then it condenses on the various trays as it goes up. And up here at the top where the temperature is the lowest, you have uh, some of what they call, you know, like the lighter hydrocarbons that then are taken out as a product. Um, and down here at the bottom, you have the heavy goopy stuff like tar because it, uh, it can't boil and evaporate up or not as much of it boils and evaporates up, I guess is the more accurate way to put it. So we have separated uh, some light hydrocarbons from what they call the heavy hydrocarbons. Uh, and this is done as a continuous process. And we're going to highlight some of what that means. That means if I look right here in that little spot in my distillation column, the T, the temperature, is the same all the time uh, with respect to time. Okay, so like it is always 300 degrees right there. And uh, it also means if you look here in this pipe, the flow rate over there is the same with respect to time. In fact, the flow rate there is the same, flow rate here is the same. Uh, those, those things are not changing. So this thing is running, you're driving down the New Jersey Turnpike, you look as you're coming over the Delaware Memorial Bridge and you see the petroleum refineries that are right there. And um, you can be assured that pretty much whenever it is you're looking at them, um, they are doing more or less the same thing. So you come by at 11 p.m., same thing. Come by the next morning, same thing. Um, plants like this 
tend to close once a year um, or once every few years for a big shutdown. It is a big deal to turn them off. Big investment, um, and they are kind of running all the time. And you have, um, what are some benefits of running a thing continuously? Well, uh, it's a great way to get a lot of product, right? So this is what you do if you have lots of product. Um, and what does lots mean? That is, you're making more than, um, let's say, 0.25 kilograms per second. Okay? And that doesn't sound like very much. That's like half a pound a second. But multiply that by how many seconds there are in an hour, and this is going to get heavy really fast. Okay? Uh, so that, that is something you do there. Now let's look at a batch process that's doing a similar activity. So here is a batch process from old school Pennsylvania. We're going to do a fermentation of perhaps uh, a whole bunch of corn or wheat, and then we're going to distill that into whiskey or moonshine. Okay, so this is a well-established process that has happened over millennia, and it, again, batch process. So what does that mean? Well, the fermentation, you take your um, mash and you fill it into um, your fermentation vessel, you know, the basically the bucket that's in there. You introduce some yeast to it and you let it go for several days probably. And so the yeast consume the sugars and burp out CO2 and ethanol and uh, that goes on for a while and then eventually the yeast stop being active because the ethanol concentration has gotten to be too high. So at any given moment, if you go zoom in on some little piece of this, something different is happening. So you have change with time. Uh, and I'm going to write that mathematically, DDT. So there's, there is change with time. And that same sort of process is what gets used next door in this distillation operation. So this thing over here, this thing I've kind of crudely drawn as a batch still, uh, that uh, if you go into any uh, liquor distillery, if you're 21 and they'll let you take the tour, um, or you just look in through the window, uh, you will see a, a distillation column that doesn't look anything like the continuous process one, right? So the continuous process one in the example is 100 feet potentially, or even more tall. This thing, maybe it's 10 feet tall. Okay, so this is a much smaller physical item, could even be smaller than that. Um, and again, we're separating components based in part on their boiling point. Also, you know, their affinity for each other matters. Guess what? Water activity is still part of this. Anyway, uh, so we're boiling this, we're heating this up, and the vapors initially are much, much richer in ethanol than they are in water, even though we get ethanol and water in this drop that comes out over here. And then two minutes later, there's another drop, and this drop has a little bit more water in it um, relative to the amount of ethanol it has in it. And we need another 10 minutes, and the drop that comes out is even more watery still. Okay, so this changes with time. But uh, it makes a lot more sense to do um, in several instances. One, if you want to be flexible, uh, it is hard to run a petroleum refinery at lower capacity than it's set up to run. It's only got a range that it really works at. You can imagine if you have a 100 foot tall distillation column and you only need to make one kilogram of stuff, like it. It, it's not enough. So um, you get a lot of flexibility with a batch process. Um, you get um, also flexibility in terms of what products you make. You can kind of change it between products. Um, and uh, But they tend to be smaller processes. Um, and why is that? Change over time, and cleaning. 
Right? So if you are running this continuous process for a year at a time, um, you have that has very little downtime. If you're running a batch process, because it is changing over time, uh, in general, someone or something's got to be there monitoring it all the time. Um, and then when it's done running its batch, you've got to completely clean it out so you can do the next batch. Uh, so that's called changeover. And the changeover takes a lot of time. Cleaning takes a lot of time. So what happens in the case of food? Well, this is really important. Here's the money answer here. Um, smaller scale foods, and we'll work out what that means on the next page, tend to run batch. And you'll see this advertised often on the packaging itself. So if you go pick up yourself um, some of those uh, kettle cooked potato chips from smaller vendors in the state of Pennsylvania, you'll see it says right on the front, made by hand in small batches. It's advertising that it does batch. If you buy marshmallow fluff, it says made by batch. Um, so batch has this kind of mystique to it uh, that people like to capitalize. Um, so batch processing uh, applies for just about um, every smaller scale uh, food company and also at kind of larger scale uh, for beverages for sure and for many things that have rapid changeovers, have not rapid, have lots of changeovers. So you would use this product uh, to use this production line to do many, many different products. So uh, McCormick Spices runs things by batches because they don't make um, ground pepper 24 seven. They use the ground, they have ground pepper and they have some other spices that also use that line when there's demand for those. Then the other thing that's kind of in the middle is what I'm going to call semi-continuous. And semi-continuous is really what you've been seeing um, on the How It's Made videos for larger scale food processes. And what does that mean? That means you have a large um, hopper out one end that you fill a whole bunch of stuff into, say your dough for making Cheez-Its, and then the... Uh, the machine then runs continuously, stamping out crackers and sending them through the oven until it's used up that batch of dough. So uh, for quite a lot of the process, we can treat it as continuous, but there are short breaks in the middle uh, because only so much dough was fed in in the first place. And this is you know, like, as far as I can tell, the most common thing at, uh, at even large scale food processing. There just aren't that many foods that are, have so much demand that we run at the truly continuous process level. We do semi-continuous. And what's nice about semi-continuous is, um, here, secret for people who aren't chemical engineers, the chemical engineers all love to pieces continuous processes. We love them because we hate dealing with the D DT term. We like it when that term is set equal to zero. And so um, a lot of the math that chemists know about works pretty well in a semi-continuous system because everything besides that first hopper that you filled up with dough is spewing out uh, the, the product continuously. So a reasonable question you might be asking yourself is if I'm going to imagine a popsicle business or a whatever kind of food business, how do I know where to draw the line between needing to think of uh, lots of popsicle making machines and just a simple way of doing things? And I'm going to propose for you a classic way of doing this uh, as a first pass. So this is not what you do uh, where you stop if what you're going to do is invest a million bucks. This is the first thing you do on a back of a napkin just to see if this is worth thinking about. And what uh, we're going to use something called a Fermi problem, where we just make reasonable estimates and add those all up to see what happens rather than doing precise calculations. And I invite you to go uh, look at Wikipedia for what the original Fermi problem is, named after... Uh, Enrico Fermi, uh, who is a physicist. 
And to encourage you to do this for your own popsicle, I'm going to pick a different example. I'm going to work with a veggie burger, which is a thing I did with this class um, a couple years ago. So let's imagine um, that we are working for the uh, company that makes frozen vegetables that's right down the road between Bucknell and State College. And let's say they want to make a veggie burger. What um, amount of investment should they put into equipment for making veggie burgers? Do they have to build a whole new building and fill it with lots of equipment? Or do they just need about 10 square feet for a uh, patty forming machine, which is a thing you can look it up. It's, it's not very big. It just makes food that is, you know, burger-like material into little patties. Uh, so uh, what kind of thing do we need? So let's imagine, how do we figure out how many of these we need to make? So uh, let's say we are just trying to address the local, the regional food area. And a way of estimating that um, is, let's say we're going to sell these at all the Weiss grocery stores. Okay, and so Weiss grocery stores is um, around this part of Pennsylvania and um, on south of here and on north of here, I think a little bit maybe into New Jersey and Maryland, but not that far. So we've, we've got an area to think about and they've got about, let's say 200 stores, right? And if you go and you look at the veggie burger section of that store, uh, you see, you know, it, it's not too huge. They probably have um, uh, maybe 20 different kinds of veggie burger. And of those 20 different kinds of veggie burger on the shelf all the time, they've got uh, at least 10 copies of that, right? And so, and how often does that turn over? So now we have to make something up. Let's say that we're going to sell just one kind of veggie burger to start. And uh, we know that each Weiss market has about 10 on the shelf every day. And let's, let's say they have to restock um, two or three times a week. Let's, let's make the math simple. 2x per week, 10x per time, and that many stores. Okay. And as we all know, there's 52 weeks in a year. But often when you're doing a uh, Fermi problem, you, you round things so everything kind of ends in zeros. So you can just easily run the math in your head without carrying lots of decimals. Often you round up, uh, you round down. So we have, let's say, 50 weeks. So what do we get when we put all that together? Oh, wait, we need one more fact. Um, how many veggie burgers are in our box of veggie burgers? Uh, let's let's make it the economy box of veggie burgers. Let's say there's 10 veggie burgers in each box. Okay, so now we can put this all together. And so how I put this together in my own head is I would say, well, let's see. I've got uh, 10 boxes twice a week, so that's 20 boxes, and that's uh, times 50 weeks. And then I'm going to add in... The 10 veggie burgers that are in the box. And now I'm going to multiply all that by the 200 stores. And now I get um, 2 million, basically. Two, 2 million burgers. That sounds like a lot, right? I'm going to have to build a really big machine with this. Well, maybe not. Let's, let's do a little bit more math. So one burger is going to be, let's say it's uh, an eight ounce burger. That's a, that's a pretty common size for a burger. And so this means we now have 16 million um, ounces of burger stuff, which conveniently, because there's 16 ounces in a pound, that means we're talking about 1 million pounds, right? And yes, I know I did just flip between pounds and kilograms, but Cope. Okay. Now uh, we got to look at our machines and what sort of thing they can do. So let's go take a quick look at a burger patty forming machine. Okay. So we've just visited our friends at the Googles and we can see here's some uh, burger forming machines. They're just kind of hand held presses, but we want to do uh, a company. So might, for example, we might look here uh, at the 
production line, your partner for burger production. I could talk to a burger production specialist. Wow, that sounds awesome. I can scan for fat. Um, let's let's check out forming uh, burger patties because that seems to be the sort of thing we're most interested in here. Can make lots of burger. Oh, look, smiley face burgers. I'm you know that's that's new to me. So let's see the different sorts of things. Whoops, I'm back to that same page. The different sorts of machines we might have um, here. Here we go. So there's uh, premium. There's master. There's uh, well. So this is a pretty big scale right here. Let's just take a quick peek at the master former. Um, they of course would like us to contact their specialists. So let's see what sort of specifications we have here. I've got to contact the team. Yeah, plate former. Oh, and we wait. Loading, loading, loading. Okay, maybe not. Well, <laughs> I seem to have crashed the web. All right, here we go, good. So you can see there's, you, you would put the meat up in this hopper up here at the top, which just got covered over, and burgers come pouring out of the side, um, hygienic, and here's the capacity. Here's the bit that I wanted us to get to. 2,500 kilograms per hour. Okay, so hold that number, and we're going to shrink this whole thing down so we can go back to doing our math. So that's going to hang out there for just a moment. So having shrunk that down, here's that patty forming machine. Um, it's got not too big a footprint, you know, so you could fit this easily in a 10 foot by 10 foot space. And then the meat goes in up here, the burgers come out there. And it was uh, 2,500 kilograms per hour. So that's uh, 5,500 pounds of burgers. Uh, it's pumping out per hour. So now we want to put these two numbers together and figure out how many hours we've got to run. So how many hours do we have to run? I want you to hit pause here, divide these things out and figure and, and look at this because we will have very rapidly have gone from a million burgers, oh my gosh, it's my entire life to make a million burgers to, well, let's see, um, 5,500 uh, 5, pounds per hour into a million pounds. That gets us, um, I'm gonna round up, I'm gonna call it 200 hours of effort. So I'm rounding up here. So that's, uh, if we have 200 hours, if I'm doing my math, thinking it through right, and 200 hours, 200 hours, like how much time is that? Is that a lot of time? Well, let's just estimate we had a 40 hour work week. So that's five weeks. And that's only one shift. So we don't have to work 24 seven to make this. We don't even have to work. We have to work slightly more than a month to make all the veggie burgers that all the Weiss markets are gonna need for the entire year, okay? So really, we would uh, it would be ridiculous to come up with a continuous process for this, right? A completely continuous process would make way more burgers. It would just have to, or it would make burgers super duper slowly um, whereas here, I think we go completely what I would call semi-batch, that some burger stuff gets fed into the hopper, the burgers come formed out, we pop them into the freezer, we pop them into boxes, um, and so the part over here behaves continuous, but the part over here behaves batch, and uh, then we use this for some other products during the times when we don't need these particular veggie burgers because it is not, in fact, that much time. This is how we come to the conclusion that something that is uh, a food that's serving a region uh, really doesn't need a big factory. Um, I don't know if you've ever been out to see Purity Candy, but that's making all that candy, all those chocolate-covered pretzels, and their production line doesn't even take up 10 feet by 10 feet. Um, it's in a relatively small building, and most of that relatively small building is the store. So um, when you're thinking about scale, you can probably do really high-end popsicles 
uh, with the equivalent of this kind of machine and uh, make plenty of them.